Hi everyone, my name is Breeze and I work as an internal medicine trainee in the United Kingdom. Today we're going to talk about FY2 standalones versus non-training jobs. So let's first talk about what a FY2 standalone is. An FY2 standalone is also known as an LAT or a locum appointment for training. These are training posts at an FY2 level. So essentially what you have to keep in mind is in the UK internship, what is known as the UKFPO or the foundation program, there is an FY1 and an FY2. If you've already completed an acceptable pattern of internship back home, you've already met the FY1 requirements. You've met that equivalent. So now you have full GMC registration. And if you want to, you can apply for an FY2 standalone post, which are gaps in their foundation program. Non-training jobs, on the other hand, are basically jobs that are not in training. So they may be at the equivalent of a training job. For instance, an FY1 equivalent or an FY2 equivalent non-training job. These jobs are not within a structured training program, but they have the same requirements and duties that a, an individual would have as a trainee. If you still have some confusion about what is considered a training or a non-training post, please check out our video where we go more in depth. So now let's talk about if you would be eligible to apply for an FY2 standalone post. So there are two things that you would require at the time of application and two things that you would require by the time the post starts. First of all, you need to just have passed PLAB 1 at the time of the application. You also need to have the required marks in IELTS or OET by the time of the application. Now the requirements for IELTS would be that you need to have a minimum of 7.5 in each module and overall in IELTS and a minimum of 400 and overall 400 in your OET. For the two things that you would require by the time your post starts, you need to have full GMC registration and you need to have completed either ILS or ALS. For a non-training job, you can apply once you've passed PLAB 2. You don't need to have full GMC registration when you start applying for jobs, but obviously you need to have full GMC registration by the time the job starts. You have no further English requirement because you've already met the requirements as laid out for your GMC registration, so you don't need to take IELTS or OET again, nor do you need to get a higher score in IELTS or OET. You also don't need to worry about ILS or ALS. You can do that within your non-training job, and most times the hospitals cover part or all of the cost as part of your study budget. Now let's talk about when and how you can apply for your FY2 standalone or non-training post. So for an FY2 standalone, the applications open in January, and the application is only open for a specific period of time from January onwards. The reason for this is training periods have their own times of opening and closing as compared to non-training posts, which are open year round. The only thing you'd have to take in consideration when you're applying for a non-training job is the closing date of that particular advert. Otherwise, on the NHS Jobs website, you could always apply throughout the year. But like I said, for the FY2 standalone, they'll start opening up in January on the Oriole website. They will not be listed on NHS Jobs. Another thing you need to keep into consideration is whether or not it would be appropriate for you to proceed with taking an FY2 standalone or a non-training job given the time that you may have taken PLAB 1. So let me give you an example. Let's say that in November you've taken PLAB 1. Now remember that I said that you need to have at least the IELTS or OET requirement by the time of the application along with having passed PLAB 1. If by January you feel that you've met those qualifications and that by the coming August you'll have passed other, the other part of PLAB and you've gotten your GMC registration and you've completed ILS or ALS, then you can think about doing an FY2 standalone because the time slots kind of match up. On the other hand, if you feel that once you pass PLAB 1 in November, you can complete PLAB 2 fairly quickly and get GMC registration fairly quickly to the point that you can apply for a non-training job before August, that is also an option. Please also keep in mind that if you've taken PLAB at an earlier date, let's say if you take June PLAB, you have to remember that you'd have to wait until January before you can apply, and then the next year's August before that post actually starts. If this works out for you, if you have other requirements and you think that this makes the most sense for you, then you can by all means think about doing an FY2 standalone, but I just wanna make it very clear that there are options on a non-training level for you to get a job before the FY2 standalone. By no means am I trying to dissuade anyone from taking a standalone. I just want to make it very clear because we've had people contact us, you know, saying, I really want to do a standalone, but I didn't know I'd have to wait so long for a job to start because this isn't something they take into consideration. 
So if the timeline does match and meet up for you, think about a standalone. But if you know or you believe that you could get a non-training job before that, then also consider that option. Now, of course, you might have the question of what rotations you'd be working in in a standalone post. Please remember that an FY2 standalone is a rotational post. As I mentioned before, it's like your internship that you would have had back home. So during your internship, you obviously weren't just in one department, you rotated throughout different departments. When you get a rank, which basically tells you how well you did against everyone else um, as per your application or interview, you then have to select your preferences and you put together a list of which rotations and what hospitals you'd like to work at. So you can see then what you know rotations are available. Let's say now, if you're someone who is very interested in doing surgery, you'll obviously try and put at the very top of your preferences those types of rotations that have a lot of surgical, surgically backed kind of things, like for instance, you know, trauma and orthopedics or A and E or perhaps even obs gyne, things that could add towards your surgical portfolio for you to progress later on in your career. Now. Just because you've done that doesn't mean that that preference will be the preference that you get. So you're going to be, you know, putting together a bunch of preferences on this list. And when you do that, you have to remember your rank again. Like I said, if you rank very well, you have a very good chance of getting the preference that you chose. But if you've not ranked very high, if someone else has chosen the same preference as you have above you, okay, in the sense that their rank is higher than you, but you know, you've chosen the same preferences for the same hospitals or the same rotation, they will get that preference because their rank is better than yours. So for instance, if I really, really simplify it, if my rank is two, but your rank is one, and we both put as our number one preference, um, you know, Darefoot Hospital, for instance, where I currently work, if we both put Darefoot Hospital, you would get it because you are ranked as number one and I'm ranked as number two that is how your preferences would work. So please remember whatever preferences you put, they are not set in stone for this very reason. Unless you do very well, or you are very lucky in that no one else has chosen those preferences higher than you, then you will not necessarily get the preferences that you have put down. This is in contrast to a non-training post, because what happens in a non-training post, when you look on the NHS jobs advert, you can see what kind of job post they are telling you that they want you to take. It may be rotational, it may not be rotational. You might do six months in A&E, you might do six months in geriatrics, or you might have a year's post where you do four months in different places. But like I said, this is something as a non-training you know, in a non-training post that you can talk about in the interview, you can talk about afterwards to HR to see how you'd start out. Another thing you need to keep in mind in about an FY2 standalone, given that it is rotational, and I mentioned to you before that there's not a guarantee that you get the exact rotations that you are hoping for based on your preferences. For instance, because this is something that a lot of people have come back and told us. Let us say that you intend on applying for internal medicine training in the next year. So naturally, you will try and put together a lot of preferences that have a medicine kind of background or rotation, like you know geriatrics or cardiology or acute medicine, so that during your time in an FY2 standalone, you can put together a really good portfolio and put together the, all the stuff that you would want to progress for internal medicine training. If, however, you are unlucky and you start, you know, you find out that the rotations that you re you've received for your FY2 standalone are, let's say, psychiatry, trauma, and orthopedics and obstetrics and gynecology, you may feel that you know, you, you've kind of left yourself with a bit of trouble because how will you get all of the competencies and things signed off or show the, the uh, dedication that you wanted to show for internal medicine training given the specialties that you are in. That doesn't mean to say that if this were to be an incident or situation that you would find yourself in, that you would not be able to put together a portfolio for internal medicine training, but it would be considerably more difficult than somebody who was in a non-training post who was in something that was fully dedicated to medicine. Even if you are in this type of a situation where you are not in any medicine rotations, you can still try and find ways if you're very proactive to get mini kexes. DOPS and CBD signed off. And if you're very confused about what I'm talking about, please check out this video, which is a part of a course that we've done on Creston Portfolio for IMGs. In an FY2 standalone, obviously you will have certain responsibilities that your non-trainee um, counterpart would not have. You guys still have the same job description. You still have the same duties that you're expected to fulfill. But obviously as a trainee, you have to maintain a portfolio and you have to report back to your clinical and educational supervisor so that they can see that you are on track to progress with your training as they want you to. So as a non-trainee, 
more often than not, you do have a clinical supervisor. Occasionally, some hospitals will even provide you with an educational supervisor. But you don't think that just because you don't have one, that doesn't mean that you cannot progress on your own. Likewise, as an FY2 standalone, your hospital will provide you with a Horace portfolio where you could put together all the things to show how you are progressing. As a non-trainee, you can still ask your postgraduate medical center for these things. For instance, when I was a non-training CT1, I spoke to my postgraduate medical center and they gave me access to the Horace portfolio for free. If your hospital still does not give you this access, you can always print off these forms online and still show your commitment or show the tasks that you have done. Do not think that you are fully limited and just, just because you're in a non-training post that you cannot show your competencies or show what you're able to do. So to kind of rehash this just a little bit, as an, F, an, an, an individual in an FY2 standalone post, you are someone who has a clinical supervisor, an educational supervisor. You have a training portfolio, and that training portfolio obviously will come with responsibilities that you need to maintain. A non-trainee would most likely have a clinical supervisor because that would be the consultant that you were directly working under. May or may not have an educational supervisor, may or may not have a portfolio, but you can still keep your own stuff together and you have no other responsibilities, you have a more flexible approach to understanding how the NHS works because you have no other responsibilities outside of you just coming and fulfilling your day-to-day -day duties. So in an FY2 standalone post, obviously, like I said, it's a training post, so somebody will be monitoring your progression. And the accumulation of this monitoring is something known as the ARCP, or the Annual Review of Competence Progression. This is something that all trainees must go through and essentially they'll be looking through your portfolio to see that you've been ticking all the right boxes, doing all the things that you need to be doing to say that you are progressing as an FY2 would at this level. A non-trainee, however, does not go through an ARCP process. What they have instead is known as an appraisal. An appraisal is something that is done by your trust within the hospital. You have a revalidation officer who appoints somebody to be your appraiser. What they do is they also set some short-term and long-term goals for you that you then will try and, and aspire to work towards. For instance, you might think in six months time, I wanna pass this exam, or maybe in a year's time, I wanna be in a training post, and this is all listed in. It is not something that you would have to be overly concerned about, but obviously if you're thinking about progression, it's good to kind of lay out your ideas and plans. With this appraisal, it's something that you would have to do as a non-trainee, no matter how long you stay as a non-trainee. Now, your FY2 standalone is a one-year post. When you get to the end of this post, if you've met all the requirements and you've met the ARCP, you get a foundation program certificate of completion, okay? So this is basically a certificate that, that says that you've done everything that you needed to do to progress through this training as an FY2 and they are happy with what you've done. This is something, like I said, that is actually given to you so long as you meet all of these requirements. Now. As a non-trainee, depending on the length of your post, it could be a three-month post, a six-month post, a one-year post, et cetera, et cetera, you do not really get anything unless you work for something. If you are proactive, you can get your Certificate of Readiness to Enter Specialty Training or Crest form signed off if you're thinking that in the near future you want to progress into a core or specialty training. So with the Crest form, there are certain requirements that you must fulfill, and like I said, you must be proactive. No one will hand you the crest at the very end of your non-training job. You need to mention it to your educational or clinical supervisor, whichever you have, as soon as you start your job, that this is what you intend to do, that this is this crest form and you wanna do all of these things so that you can get it signed off within three months or maybe more. Whatever it comes down to, while you do get something at the end of your FY2 standalone, you will only get something at the end of your non-training job if you work towards it. If you decide that you don't want to do Crest, no one will chase you to do it. You don't have to get a Crest form signed off if you want to stay in a non-training job for whatever length of time. But please keep in mind that if you want to progress and then enter into training, you will need a Crest form. A lot of things that, a lot of times what confuse people is if I do an FY2 standalone, this paper that they'll give me, this foundation you know, of certificate of, of, of completion of, of my competencies, it's going to be better than the Crest form and I'll get extra points in my training application. It's not true. Your FPCC or your Crest, they're equivalent. That's the reason they've put it together. Even some local British graduates who have gone and done what they call gap years for a certain period of time, before they can come back and apply for training, they need to complete a Crest form. 
So they're not going to disadvantage anyone if you do a crest form or if you go via the foundation program. They're called equivalency forms for that particular reason. So don't think that you have to do a standalone because you'll get a special certificate that'll give you bonus points. It's the same thing. Now you can argue it would be easier for you to complete the, this foundation program because it'll be pushing you towards getting into you know, everything that they want done so that you get the certificate at the very end. But that doesn't mean, and as a non-trainee, you can't you know, be ambitious and progress and push yourself like many of us have. As I mentioned earlier, we have an extensive course on Crest and Portfolio, which will go through the entire process as a non-trainee, and even as a trainee, if you're looking at this as an FY2 standalone individual, to know what you need to understand to progress and put your portfolio together. Please, again, I want to make this very clear. Do not feel pressurized that you must start off in your first job in the NHS in a training post. A training post comes with a lot of responsibilities, even at an FY2 level. So if you feel that you still will need some time to adjust to the NHS, or that might be too much to think about adjusting to a new place, a new job, a new environment, and to have training responsibilities, please think twice before you apply for a training post. Again, I do not want to dissuade anyone from doing what they feel that they want to do, but I'm just trying to lay, lay the you know, facts out there because we get people messaging us a lot of the times who have taken training posts in the first, in the first instance as, as their first job in the NHS, and I, might, I mean FY2 standalones when I say this, and they feel overwhelmed because they weren't ready for all of the things that we are talking about. We'd like to think that the courses that we have can help you prepare, but honestly, that is not a guarantee. If you think you want to you know, slowly progress your way into the NHS and then think about Crest once you start in your non-training job, that is definitely an option. But if you feel that you can be up to it, an FY2 standalone is not a bad idea. So now let's talk about your pay. In an FY2 standalone post, you are gonna get the same pay as somebody who is at a FY2 level within the UK foundation program. Now the NHS throughout has a basic pay and an extra added pay that are their on calls. And these basic pays are the same like I said, it's a standard pay. If you have any confusion or want to know a little bit more about what this pay is, check out our article that we've linked in the description box below called A Doctor's Pay in the UK. As a non-trainee, however, like I said before, you can think about applying at different levels at a non-training level. For instance, you might be a non-training CT1, non-training ST1, and et cetera, et cetera. Because of the varied nature of these posts, you can actually potentially make more as a non-trainee than a trainee if you take into consideration the difference in the titles. Because as mentioned in the post that we've link linked below, there is a difference in pay when you think about a difference in title. An FY1 doesn't make as much as an FY2 who doesn't make as much as a CT1. And whatever level you're working in as a non-trainee, if you take into consideration the amount of work that you have and the on-calls associated with it, you may find that your pay rate may be more than somebody in a standalone. Also, if you have some experience from back home, you can talk up your experience and there may be a chance for you to also increase your pay based on your experience. So I hope that this breakdown between an FY2 standalone and a non-training job was really helpful for you guys to help you make a decision about what you think is best. I will again reiterate, I came to the UK in a non-training post, completed my crest, and then started internal medicine training. I know some people who did an FY2 standalone and have gotten into training. Like I said, there is no discrepancy nor discrimination on whether or not you come via a standalone or if you come via a non-training job when you apply for training. It's just about you and of course your timing. Like we talked about, you know, what time of the year you can apply or what would be most appropriate given your background and understanding, whether or not you really want to start in a training or non-training post. All of this, guys, I hope will help you make a comprehensive and balanced decision so that you can make your own pros and cons list about what's best for you. So I, as I said again, I really hope that this helped you and please stay tuned for more videos from us in the future. And if you're not already, please like us on Facebook, subscribe to us on YouTube and follow us on Instagram.